So it, it, it was just the beginning slide. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I thought then I should just talk about how we work as meteorologists to do our forecast. First, we, we rely on, on observations. We use satellite data. We use radar data. Um, and really, this is to show the value chain that, that, that we need to follow. And when we've got problems with our early warning systems, it's because any stage of um, that I'm showing there can be associated with some issues. If we don't have a proper representation of our observations, we have a problem with the forecast that we produce. We've got models, we know they are not perfect. Sometimes they can miss events. We've got um, processing where we need to be able to see properly what the models are saying, if they are able to capture events. And we also have forecasters that look at output from these models. Um, and they are the ones that will then communicate with, with the public on what is happening to provide the warnings. And we can also go a step further using model output as well as observations to develop um, products for different sectors. I've just listed some examples there. But you know, with weather and climate, we know that a lot of, actually all of us, you know, what we do, the way we dress will depend on what the weather is like. And then there's also so the, the dissemination point um, that we are also to some extent struggling with that if you've got a warning and you're issuing it and the people that need to respond do not get to receive that warning, um, then you um, basically you could say that the warning is useless because people that are supposed to get out of harm's way do not leave, don't know that they need to do that. But the focus of the work that we are doing is really on the oral part. So I will not deal with the aspects, the issues of dissemination that we've got, the issues of observations that we know exist. So our models solve the partial differential equations. So we know there are some basic laws that, that, that are followed. We've got you know, conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, um, as well as conservation of energy. So the weather and climate models, they work in a similar way. They solve these types of models. Um, and the way we are able to get high resolution over the area we're interested in, we use what we call uh, regional modeling. And by that, we only run a model over an area you are interested in with high resolution. And you rely on a global model, a model that uses causal resolution to provide you with the boundary conditions, the lateral boundary conditions. These we update initially, we would update every six hours. These days, we are updating every, every three hours. And this is really a procedure that is used both for weather forecasting as well as for climate change um, projections. So we don't really use all that much for seasonal forecasting because we realize there's really not much skill from uh, dynamical downscaling in that time scale. So in, in informing um, the work that, that we are doing in the region, um, we, we worked with the SADC Secretariat um, to basically determine what is happening in the region. And to do this, we sent out questionnaires to all SADC countries where we were asking questions about, you know, whether they've got HPC systems, whether they are running numerical weather predictions, if they are doing any climate change projections, if they are doing seasonal forecasting, um, the analysis they are doing, what softwares are they using? And from those questionnaires, we received responses only from eight countries that you can see being listed there. The questionnaires were sent to the meteorology uh, permanent representatives as well as to the science and technology. And really with the question is, I think our target was mostly the meteorological services. And you can see that we did receive information from all these um, meteorological services from, from the eight countries, as I've said. Um, so what, what we found out was, was that like in terms of the high performance computing systems, we found that there were three meteorological services that indicated that they've got high performance computers. We are collaborating with, with actually, I mean, one of them is the, is the South African Weather Service and then the other two that indicated that they had um, HPC systems. Actually, both their HPC systems are broken at the moment. So that means at the moment, the meteorological service that has got an HPC system yeah. that's really working off the eight countries is the South African Weather Service one. So in terms of all the eight, the, the eight countries that responded, we found that five of them have HPC systems and these actually are, are available because of the HPC 
um, ecosystems project that that Happy and, and Tiamo have spoken about, and and then obviously with South Africa, we know we've, we've got one because of our national initiative. Happy provided a an, an update on what is happening, also looking at what Zimbabwe has at the moment. And with with our question, as you also realize that the meteorological services were not aware of the HPC systems that had been deployed through the HPC ecosystem. So through our survey, we were able to get the meteorological services kind of aware that they, they are HPC systems in their countries. In terms of the running of models, they, we found there are three models that are used in all these countries. We found the weather research and forecasting model, which was is a community model. Uh, its development is led in the U.S. WOF is, is the mostly used. The South African Weather Service is, is using the UK Met Office um, unified model. And then we also found that four of the countries were using COSMO, which is a, a German model. Uh, and for seasonal forecasting, we found there was just one country which is running a coupled ocean atmosphere model. And there were actually a number of them that are using statistical downscaling, using uh, what we call the climate predictability tool to do their seasonal forecasting. And then when it comes to resolution, so the moment the meteorological services that are really well resourced, they use a grid spacing of about one kilometer let's say one kilometer up to about five kilometers. And we found that three of the med services were actually running um, with a resolution of about three kilometers. So results from the survey that, that we, we have conducted are published in, in a paper we published um, with the Data Science Journal. So for more information on what we, we found out, you know, with, with our survey, you can um, look at that paper. So what we concluded though from the paper was it basically in terms of saying what are the areas that we need to be working on. And you can see that in the end, we basically ended up saying that we, we need to be working on all areas. We need to be working on simulations. We need to be able to run models. We need to do some post-processing. Um, we need to be developing products for different sectors. And we do need to do quite a bit of training. We wanted, we have to do some, you know, ACD training people just to run model training people to analyze data. And we also need to be training more postgraduate students so that, you know, they continue to do their masters and PhD degrees um, in meteorology. And for us to be able to do this work, we do need funding. So, you know, one of the things that we try to do is to continue to mobilize for, for funding and we write proposals as we see, you know, calls for funding um, coming out. So we were successful um, in, in one of the calls, the Climate Research for Development, CR4D, it's funding from, from the UK. Uh, so we were given, so we were successful, you know, we were given 100,000 US dollars to be able to implement this project. And, you know, because the funding was limited, we were not able to include all the countries within SADC. So the project focused on Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, as well as Zambia. And as we're doing our work, we want to also be able to collaborate with, you know, people that we know have been working in the modeling space for a long time. And we are collaborating with NASA, we are collaborating with the UK Met Office, as well as with, with the University of Reading. This funding is administered by the, by the African Academy of Sciences. And the photo I'm showing there was when, um, that when um, the launch was taking place in June last year in, in, in Kenya, which was hosted by, by the AAS. The, the aim of, of our project is basically to say we want to improve weather and climate early warning systems, but because of the limited time that we had, really our research objectives focused on the weather side. We were asking questions about yeah, um, how do models perform when, when um, simulating heavy rainfall events. So we were also evaluating the numerical weather prediction models that are being used. We were testing different configurations. And at the same time, we also wanted to make some improvements um, in the models, but we really did not get to the, this, this step. And we also wanted to ask questions around the development of products for, for climate sensitive sectors. So there's quite a bit of work that, that we have done. As I mentioned, six countries that are participating in the project, we think of it as a pilot. Um, and in terms of the research questions that we've been able to 
to to ask you you can see this is um, how models work in, in in general so you've got different um grid spacings that you can use and these really determine how your, your model function and the resolutions that we focused on were nine kilometers and three kilometers and different countries looked at different research questions south africa and namibia were looking at the impact of changing resolution uh, Mozambique and Tanzania are looking at the sensitivity of heavy rainfall events to deep convection, to deep convection schemes. Zambia was looking at, um, you know, sensitivity to the boundary layer schemes, while Botswana was looking at sensitivity to the microphysics schemes. So we have made quite a bit of um, progress in, in, in that project. We were able to run three workshops. And in the first workshop, what we wanted was to get meteorologists from the different med services in these countries, as well as the hosts of the different HPC systems in one room in order for them to implement the weather research and forecasting model. And this is a workshop that we ran in, in, um, in August. 2019 and we were able to implement WOF um, on all the HPC systems. Um, we ran a second workshop in December where we had people that came to implement models coming now presenting simulations that they were able to generate on these HPC systems that are hosted in, in, in different countries. And um, so as I mentioned that there are different, um, you know, research questions that different countries are looking at and we do, you know, we did get some take home messages and one of them really being that you can't just take your model and just run it when you don't understand how the configuration is supposed to work. With the Namibia study, we were able to show that you, you need to switch off the convection scheme when, when you're using a three kilometer resolution model, for example, because if you don't, the type of simulation you get when using a grid spacing of three kilometers are somewhat similar to the simulations you get when using a grid spacing of nine kilometers. So the expectation is as you increase the resolution, you should be able to resolve more. But if the configuration is wrong, you don't actually get that benefit of high resolution. So we also saw that turbulence um, has a big impact on you know, whether or not you are able to cap capture an event taking place. And this we showed with the study that we conducted for Zambia. And with the microphysics schemes, to be honest, we didn't see a big difference in the simulations. We found that the different microphysics schemes actually perform similar to one another, and they were all different um, to observations. Um, and, and the observations themselves were different from one another because we've got satellite estimations um, that we can also compare with the reanalysis. We know that as Africa, we are really sparse when it comes to our ground observations. So our study also indicates that there is a need um, for us to, you know, to get ground observations that we can use um, to, to, to verify our models. And the studies that focused on convection, we could see that you know, the models really just overestimate rainfall. So from the process that, that, that we have learned, so there are some lessons learned that, that, that we've seen just you know, from interacting you know, as different countries, how we work together, what is available um, on the ground. We are working on, on, on papers, and what I'm showing here are two papers that are under review, the Botswana paper as well as the Namibia paper. Uh, the Botswana one is we, we've published a preprint of it, so it's available to those that are in, that want to see it on the African Academy of Sciences Open Research. Um, this one, the Namibia paper, is not available as as a as a preprint. Um, so we need to finalize um, other papers. The, the, the um, Tanzania as well as the South Africa paper are at an advanced stage and we are working on papers for Mozambique as well as um, Zambia. And um, so the project that we have has come to an end. So we need to mobilize for more funding which will make it possible for us to collaborate um, you know, longer. What we found was that when we had to go through the literature for each of the countries, there was very limited literature, very limited modeling literature for us to quote. Um, even actually just the research itself alone, just on meteorology, we found there weren't a lot of papers that we could quote on, on the work that has been done. 
And we found that this, um, I mean, working with the med services themselves, we found they didn't really have time themselves to do much of the research, which calls for, you know, more collaboration with the universities. So the med services in all these countries actually need to work closely with the universities so that they can help them with, with their research. So I thought I, I will, um, you know, finish my talk by talking to model development. This is a, a conversation that has um, just started in South Africa alone. Um, the models that we are using right now, the models that are producing climate change projections that we are using for, for seasonal forecasting, um, that we are using also for weather forecasting, were, were all developed um, either in the US or in Europe. Um, so majority of them, actually there are very few that have been developed in the Southern Hemisphere. And a recent study has shown that, um, you know, how the model behaves depends on who is developing it. There was a comparison that was done where the US models, the US model wolf uh, generates some very big thunderstorms while the UM, which was developed in the UK, generates intense small thunderstorms. And these simulations didn't actually, um, um, were, they were simulated by the models, but they were not observed. So we also need, you know, to say as Africans, we want to, to, to also contribute towards the development of models. Um, so that we can have our processes being represented correctly in, in these models. I think I, I, I will end there with some photos that show some of the workshops that, that, that we have held. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mupapi, for, for that uh, uh, discussion on the project that is really meant to galvanize the, 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 the community, especially the med services. And you highlighted there that um, the, the interface between these and, and universities needs to, to be defined and, 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 and encouraged. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, through this project, University of Botswana is, 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 is participating. Uh, we've seen, seen what you are discussing, i.e. an attempt by the Med Service to, to really exploit some of the conduits uh, interfaces we have. Uh, we have uh, them using our HPC, as you, as you highlighted. There is a strong atmospheric physics group uh, at the university that I think going forward um, uh, will benefit from, 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 from engagement with, with us. And more importantly, students themselves, master students, uh, PhD students, even undergrad, getting to appreciate this multidisciplinarity of, of, of research. There's also institutions like SADC that have got uh, the climate services group. Uh, we've seen through this project some interest uh, originally them to, to, to coordinate. Dr. Ketebi, I think, I think we've done justice to the three, four pillars that, that's original. We thought um, the, the work on the cyber infrastructure would, would, would share with the community, i.e. The, the issue of, of infrastructure itself through Dr. Sitole's uh, 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 presentation, the issue of data in all its uh, uh, dimensions uh, from Dr. Hodson, and, and, and the issue really of how do we really now use uh, what we have set up to, to, to push the boundaries of science, but also to enhance collaboration. Uh, the rest of the slides that I have really uh, was going to expand on Botswana's experience across all those areas, but I see that my colleagues have also already done justice to, to that particular one. So I think with your permission and with the permission of the colleagues who are probably uh, been waiting, we can, we can end the conversation there and invite any, any questions regarding some of the presentations. The presentations themselves are shared as slides. Um, we have copious amounts of slides. Dr. Hodgson's one has got links, Dr. Sitolis. And you can see from Dr. Bupapis as well, uh, leverage points that we can leverage collaboration. On my slides as well, there are many, many links, including the updates on the conferences that we host. I think it's important as Africans and African member states to really now start thinking about hosting conferences in the continent. Um, we have conferences like IST Africa that I'm in the organizing committee of that is also pushing for publications uh, continentally around science and technology uh, 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 to, to, be, to be hosted here. The International Data Week also presented an opportunity for Africa and we showcased that Africa can host these conversations. And we also got other conferences like um, ACCs, we've done Visa Africa, which is really looking at data visualization. So really, I think it's, it's opportune to, for Africa to start hosting conferences. So some of the slides that I've provided are also providing that update. 
The other issue that has been highlighted also through Dr. Hodgson's presentation, the issue of policy. What is it that institutions are doing regarding data policies? What is it that countries are doing regarding data policies? Because these policies will really spell out a lot of things, including how can we share data, what data can we share, and how data is, 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 is made available for sharing. So I think there are some updates on our slides on those issues. I think we just leave there for, for now, given that we, we have provided the, the presentation. So Dr. Kitevi, I think we leave it there and uh, hand over to you uh, to see the rest of the program. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Chair Amo uh, and uh, all of our speakers, I really, um, I really would like to so, thank so, you. So this is me. Um, Chair Amo, can you hear me? I can hear you, Kitevi. Uh, okay, fine, yeah. I just want to say that I would like to thank you guys uh, for these uh, comprehensive presentations. Um, I'd like to ask uh, if anybody has any questions. I have myself a few questions, but uh, maybe there is no time, but I would like to give the opportunity for the people connected. If anybody has uh, any questions uh, on uh, what has been presented, all the opportunities uh, that have been shared with us. Uh, let me see if there are some questions in the chat or not. Um, I think, Chayamo, I we will uh, find another opportunity where we can just organize maybe a half a day workshop so that you guys can have more time to, uh, uh, you know, take us through uh, all of these uh, very uh, impressive progress that is going on in the continent. Um, Dr. Situale, one question I have for you is about uh, the fiber optics uh, connection across Africa and uh, within across different uh, countries. Whether is he, uh, you know, a technology that is uh, developing in order to be able to share a large volume of data bandwidth or not? Uh, most of the problem that we have been facing is really, you know, to use uh, uh, e-lab or e-learning facilities or digital libraries, things that really require our countries in Africa to be well connected. And it's not completely clear where do they stand in terms of the fiber, fiber optics or in terms, in terms of all of the satellites or connections to be able to move our data very, very quickly. I, I think you mentioned some of those things, but could you comment a little bit on, further on that? Yeah, no, in, in, indeed, uh, the, I think that the biggest challenge that we see in the continent is still um, the level of uh, connectivity. And, and very good design connectivity. Um, if I look at a country like South Africa, and we just did a map now, and, and looking at the, um, the fiber connection. Uh, at, at the moment, um, through the NREN, we managed to get all the institutions to be connected through fiber. So the picture that I showed you, so that covers uh, the rest of the country uh, to all the institutions. We have also done um, an, an intensive study looking at um, the investment that the country has put. And we found that there is quite a lot that the government uh, entities have invested in, in fiber. For an example, in South Africa, we found that um, We've got entities like Transnet, which is um, locomotive. And uh, wherever where you have got the railroad, we found that there is fiber also linked with that. We've got entities that looking at uh, the roads. Um, they also have got fiber in each and every new road that they build. But uh, uh, strange enough, that um, uh, fiber is not being used optimally. So uh, every, every entity is just using it for specific purposes. So we have got some of those, but still, even when you look at that part, 
um, not the whole country is covered with that. Um, in, during the lockdown now, when we started with uh, the COVID-19 lockdown, one of the key challenges that we had was, once the students now they move from the campuses, how do they get access to connectivity? And that was a big challenge. What we realized is that uh, uh, you don't get any decent fiber connections. Like for an example, in the cities, you do have got fiber uh, connecting to homes and people are able to uh, access fiber and things like online learning can take place. For an example, if I give you an example with me, I've got three boys who are at school. And during that time, they had to go uh, online studies. I also had to work from home. So you could imagine if you are just uh, depending on um, a connectivity which is not decent, then you won't be able to do those type of things. So um, you, you, you really need fiber. And when we looked at uh, most of the areas, like for an example, rural areas, there was a big challenge because in those areas, you don't get even little fiber in those areas. So the fiber is mainly around the cities, but uh, the broader community like in rural areas, they depend on mobile connectivity. So a lot still has to be done to make sure that we can be able to reach out to the broader communities. But I will say for research and education, at least there has been some significant move in that area. I think uh, in South Africa, basically you have got all the institutions covered and you have got decent connectivity. I know country like Botswana also, they are working on that uh, to get their connectivity across the country. We have got the, the national research um, networks in various uh, African countries. Uh, for an example, in Zambia, you've got what you call Zamran, you've got uh, Kenneth in Kenya, you've got uh, uh, Moronet in Mozambique. So there is a drive in most of the African countries to build research network and based on fiber. But still you'll find that it mainly covers um, the, the urban areas and uh, we still have got little coverage on connectivity for rural areas. So the challenge of depending on mobile connectivity is still huge. We did a map of uh, the connectivity across South Africa on mobile. And we found that there's quite a very good coverage of mobile connectivity. But uh, when you are going to look at using that for an example for education, like uh, in my case, I spend the whole day on um, online now because we're working from home. Uh, that is not sustainable with mobile um, data because that will be very expensive. So I think those are the challenges. But the other thing maybe coming into looking at this problem for the continent is uh, as we have got these portraits of the entrance across um, the continent, you still want to get the countries to be able to connect across the borders. And that is something that uh, still needs to be looked at to make sure that you can easily be able to connect across the borders. But I've got also very good examples. I think you saw um, on my uh, utilization of HPC, you saw that uh, there are users coming from Kenya, from uh, various parts of uh, the African continent who connect to our system in Cape Town and they connect seamlessly, they can be able to work. So there is hope in how the continent can be able to access research infrastructures, but uh, it will still be a challenge if we have to move huge amounts of data and, and have uh, the principles that uh, Simon was talking about, I mean, of fair sharing of the data, those will still remain some challenges, but there's some investments that are taking place. Is there Thank some, you, uh, some uh, you know, uh, pan-African or AU-driven type of uh, collaboration and policy across the African countries to solve this problem consistently through the entire continent? 
it's, it's, a, it's a huge, you know, stumbling block for education and capacity development. Uh, yes, so I agree. Yeah. I think uh, some of the things that we see are more driven from outside. Like for an example, you see the Ubuntu Net Alliance, uh, which are more driven from Europe and US. Um, those are some of the initiatives. And, and, and I agree with you. It is important to get African countries um, to have these initiatives, for an example, of having this uh, connectivity across the continent. Um, uh, the one program that someone uh, uh, highlighted, like the African Open Science Platform. Um, I'm hoping those are some programs that can really start driving African countries to collaborate, have some tangible projects that will allow them to realize that it is important to share infrastructure across the continent. So, so to answer your question, uh, there are some programs that can really be the anchor programs that help the African countries uh, to start looking at uh, broadly connectivity across the continent. And, and through the cables, like the WAX cable, it covers all the West Africa cable uh, uh, countries. So there's already cable that is passing across these uh, countries. It's only just to go and tap into that uh, cable and connect the country. If you look at the whole of the eastern part of the continent, we have got the, the sea core that is covering all the eastern uh, part of uh, the continent. Also, that is uh, going across, I mean, uh, the, the continent. Uh, they can just simply be able to connect from there. So there, there is infrastructure that can be utilized. I think uh, in the northern part of uh, uh, the continent, there is the ASRAM that has got, that is looking at that initiative. It is more driven from Germany. So I, I, I think still it is important to have a collective view that is driven by the African Union and take all this initiative and have a program that is uh, driven from the African Union. I am not sure if ever there are those discussions, mm. but uh, I agree with you, it will be very important. Um, hey, Meiki, you, you are still connected. You want to ask your question? Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. Um, and uh, to be honest, it's like I've learned a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, new things. I have got questions related um, to... Uh, so uh, there are, they are actually one or two questions. So... The first one is, uh, yeah, just a second, <laughs> sorry. The first one is like, I want to know um, what, what is a flip, what is a B flip system? Because uh, some of us are not uh, very familiar with those terminology, because for example, um, the, those uh, topics, they are, uh, they are new to me. So I wanted to know what, what, what is the, what is the GBU and what is the B flop? system the second question is um it might not be relevant but um, the world uh, these days is talking about 5g and um, if possible we can know about that i mean what what is the difference between 5g and 4g i mean in terms of uh, in terms of the speed capacity uh, or the transformation of the information or data or uh, these things. And uh, the third one is uh, the FAIR uh, Convergence Conference. Uh, just to make sure uh, the dates, are they from the 30th of November to the 40th, to the 4th of December 2020? Or I have uh, written them wrongly. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, we heard we heard your question. Oh, so, yeah. I, yeah, okay. who who wants to take a shot at it from our speakers? Thank you very much uh, for the question. 
Um, there is the, regarding your last question on the International Data Week, um, I'll urge you to look at the conference's webpage, is the internationaldataweek.org. It will show you the previous conferences, it will show you the previous programs, it will also show you the future conferences. And international you can also, yeah, internationaldataweek.org. Um, oh. Like I said, it will also show you more information regarding, for example, uh, the various themes that were uh, covered uh, in the previous in the previous conferences. The first conferences, you know, was in Denver uh, in 2016, and the second conference was uh, in Botswana in 2018. I believe that there will be an entry there with exact dates and information regarding the upcoming conference. And then on the matter of 4G and 5G, I suppose Dr. Sito can add, but if you remember, uh, there's a fast evolution of um, networks, uh, especially when you talk about cellular networks. The different technologies, as you know, started with 1G, where you could also only just do voice. Then you had 2G, where you can also do voice and text. And then you've got 3G when you could actually now do data as well. Uh, you can, of course, like you said, compare these technologies around the issues of deployment, bandwidth, uh, latency, and average speeds. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, with 4G, you can get a bandwidth of up to 200 megabits per second. Uh, but with 5G, it's a very, very big leap. You can go over one gigabit per second. What that type of bandwidth gives you is many, many possibilities. People now are talking about the internet of things, you've got connected devices. And now with those types of speeds, you can start doing very, very interesting things. So really at the very, very core, you are looking at uh, leaps in terms of speeds, you are looking shortage in terms of latency times, and you're looking at various applications now that you can start consuming or uh, using, using 5G mm -hmm. technology. So really, uh, there is very, very good literature on the comparative tables around these technologies, but at a very minimum, think of 5G as really a leap in terms of bandwidth and average speed that you can get even for a home connection. And that gives possibilities for also for applications, including IoT applications. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Very well, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Ketebi, there was a question from somebody uh, asking about the issue of women in science, um, I think is something that we also need to emphasize a lot, uh, that in all these initiatives, uh, I think Dr. Hudson there, he showed, you, he showed us some of the pictures of the RDA and core data summer schools. There's concerted interventions to make sure that there's strong, strong representation. I've been to some of those summer schools since 2016. Uh, 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 and I've always been impressed as, the, as to how much effort has gone in. Um, Core Data and RDA are partnering with ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, as you know, that provides a lot of opportunities uh, for developing countries, fellows, for developing countries, early career researchers, and they've always in that selection process regarding any of these interventions encouraged the participation from women, especially African women. I'm aware there are certain calls for fellowships just specifically for this. So I really want to encourage the delegates who are here, uh, women scientists, to look at the ICTP websites and look at the opportunities for fellowships that are specifically targeted to women, especially African scientists. Because I would imagine that uh, there's very, very good uh, chances that they would get selected for some of the research visits, uh, for some of the trainings, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's something that uh, also in the side, like cyber infrastructure framework, we take uh, very, very, uh, seriously, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Chayamo, it's uh, really a serious uh, issue that uh, that certainly needs to be addressed, and uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, you guys take it seriously. We try to do the same also in our selection for the African School of Physics. Um, we have here connected one of uh, my colleagues. Uh, in the International Organizing Committee of the African School of Physics. So I would like to have an opportunity to introduce her, Christine Dove. So she may want to say something. So Christine, 
Yes, uh, so just maybe in, uh, in two words, so thanks a lot for those presentations. So as uh, it was already mentioned, very complementary and very comprehensible. So I think it's uh, also really important that we recorded everything. So as we mentioned earlier, that we can share even more because there was so many elements that would be very interesting to further develop. And I'm, of course, very interested by everything that you are doing as well. So in terms of the challenge, just like what Ketavi was mentioning, the connectivity, it's really still something that will be really needed to be improved so that there could be like, uh, uh, in many places, the possibility as well of using an effective as well uh, uh, bandwidth, uh, so which is one of the drivers as well for um, an effective uh, uh, connection, whether it's for e-learning or any type of um, of equipment. One of the interesting things as well that um, I, I kind of also realize is the, uh, what you were uh, as well mentioning that a lot of those uh, cables, for example, the wax, so this is uh, um, made by yourself. So do you mean that in terms of industrialization as well, you are developing those type of, um, of cable? That could be one of the questions I would have. Huh? I think uh, maybe just uh, under the part of uh, uh, <clears throat> the network connectivity, um, the Wax, for an example, is a, is a consortium of uh, companies. So we have got um, private companies in South Africa, and um, we also share in as part of the consortium. So to connect, say for an example, on the Wax, so telco companies, we've got now um, uh, some of uh, the cloud providers like your Microsoft Azure, you've got uh, also um, um, AWS, Amazon, uh, they build in data centers this side. So you get a lot of private companies that want to be able to do that. So basically you've got that um, uh, big pipe and uh, people then share the capacity. So we buy on that for the international. So for, for national uh, in the country, we have got uh, different fiber installations which have been put by various organizations from government. Uh, in the cities, we have got private companies who build their own fiber. So that is uh, built by various people. So you can just buy uh, a certain um, percentage, for an example, as a managed bandwidth. So in some areas, you don't have to be able to build, uh, to dig fiber, basically. Um, you have to, you can be able to get already built. So, but in some of the areas, like I showed you, where we want to connect the, the telescope in the Karoo. So no private company has got interest there. The reason the Karoo was chosen is because that's where nobody lives. So private companies have got no interest. They can't make money from there. So for that, we had to build our own fiber. We have to dig and put our own fiber. Uh, in terms of uh, where does the fiber comes from? In South Africa, we have got the legislation specifically on that to say that 90% uh, of uh, the manufacturing must be from the country mm -hmm. and only 10% should be imported. So the components of the fiber that comes in into that, only 10% is what we buy from overseas but the rest, these uh, cables are manufactured internally in South Africa. So it, it is by legislation that we ensure that um, the whole um, benefit of this program uh, stays in the country. And I think uh, I saw another question that uh, was asked uh, in terms of uh, the performance of the computing systems. Um, uh, uh, one of the questions they were saying, what is the petaflop? I think it's very important uh, to address this question, to say why we need to invest into uh, cyber infrastructure. And in general, if I start with the computing part, is that um, 
and, and, and fortunately to understand that uh, most of the people around the table here are the physicists. So whenever you try to solve a problem, um, you try to solve differential equations. Um, you can solve the easiest differential equations by hand, and that will only just give you an answer. But if you really want to solve a, a physical system, it will be represented by many differential equations. And you have got many unknowns and you have to have many iterations. So we solve differential equations and then we will be reducing the matrix obviously to its eigenvalues. And um, that is uh, the matrix diagonalization and to find an answer. To do that process, it will take a lot of iterations if we have to solve it by hand. If we solve with one computer, it takes a very, very, very long time and it will limit you in the number of variables that you can have. So for a physicist and an engineer, the closer you represent the system to the real system, uh, the better. But uh, for you to be able to get to um, the, uh, the proper system, it means that you have to take out a lot of assumptions. And here maybe I can go into the quantum mechanics part to say, let's say for an example, if we go and uh, represent a system which is based or a material that is based on atoms and electrons, there are a lot of assumptions that have been made. First of all, the physicists were able just to solve the hydrogen atom because it was easy. It had only one uh, neutron and one electron. And if, even with the hydrogen atom, as much how easy it was, it was still very difficult for us to represent the energy of that. So you could imagine now where we are solving a problem with many atoms, we come up with a lot of assumptions. And for that is because our computing is not sufficient. We came from hand, we get a single computer, but now with a lot of processing capabilities, we are able to remove most of the assumptions and bring in a lot of the realities to be able to solve the systems to closer to the reality. So basically, we are talking about time and accuracy of the solution. So that is why we will strive for moving into more computing. So hence high performance computing, what it does, it's working on solving these matrices that we, we, we represent our systems in. And uh, like what uh, Mary Jane presented when uh, she's looking for the climate, they are solving uh, the Navier-Stokes uh, 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 equations and they are solving those uh, equations. They've got lots of assumptions, lots of variables, and the more they can be able to bring in um, all these terms in terms of the physical system, the closer they will be able to represent their physical system. So that, the more complex the problem is, the more computing you are going to require. So computing has evolved, and at this stage, we can now go to, in terms of the instructions per second, as 10 to the 15, which we now call uh, the, 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 the petaflops. So the petaflops, that is 10 to the 15 uh, instructions per second that the computer can be able to do. And 10 to the 18, which is the next level where we are going, it is the exaflop. So this is how it works. And the more computing you have, the more complex problems you can be able to solve quickly and more accurately. I'm hoping that uh, uh, answers uh, the question of uh, what is the petaflops and people understand why we have to, the world is gearing towards more uh, flops is because the world wants to solve bigger problems. At the moment, it has been a tussle between America, the US, 
to get the first exaflop machine, uh, which they are trying to build in the national labs. And it has been China. But uh, we have seen Japan coming from nowhere now. Uh, it wasn't in a race, but they have put a very big supercomputer now, uh, Fugaku, which is now the fastest supercomputer now, which can be able to do hundreds of uh, petaflops. And, and the hundreds of petaflops, they are closer to getting a thousand, which is the exaflop. So when they get there, it's basically uh, Japan will be a more competitive nation than anyone else because they can be able to solve much more complicated problems with those computers. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, Dr. Sitwale, very, very important uh, interjection there. There is some questions on the chat forum. Um, one is asking about uh, conferences. He says, with HPC being very vital to scientific research, uh, to modern scientists. Is there any online school or yearly conference opened to young scientists on the architectures and fundamental computer clusters? And then the second question is, additionally, the European Union has been working massively on creating various HPCs like the PRACE and Max, or Max uh, COE initiative, among others. Are there similar ones like this in Africa? Maybe let me give you an opportunity to, to answer those two questions. Okay, now, uh, th thank you very much, Tiama, for highlighting this. I think uh, the first one of talking about um, uh, building the community in the continent, I did not mention this, but um, we have got an annual meeting that is taking place in December uh, in South Africa. So, and, and I can just give you that uh, the whole world has got the meeting of high performance computing um, uh, in Europe in around June. The meeting takes place in um, uh, uh, Germany uh, for Europe. And in November, the meeting takes place in the US. And we thought it is very important for Africa to have the meeting because not all of the people will be able to travel to all those destinations. So we have got our meeting that is taking place in December. It's taking place in different parts of South Africa. And in this meeting, we get almost to close to about 800 uh, participants that come from various parts of the continent. And um, uh, the meeting is not just about talking about the technology. It has got um, a lot about uh, the development in high performance computing. We get very good speakers that talk about what the high performance computing are using um, globally. We get very good uh, leaders in high performance computing uh, coming to this meeting. Uh, but also it is important that uh, we get a lot of African young scientists showing off what they are doing with high performance computing. But uh, over and above that, there's a lot of uh, workshops starting from basics about high performance computing, teaching students on that, and, and also they are you. So there's a lot that uh, it has been done in this meeting. But uh, also we have got every June, we have got uh, uh, the, the workshops that we are uh, doing in the country, uh, which we call the winter school. The winter school here, it is open to all scientists around the continent who want to get uh, the basics of high performance computing. It starts you first with the basics and then they will even take you to being able to run your code on a high performance computer. And uh, it is also in that meeting where we have got a training for student cluster challenge where we teaching um, uh, undergraduate students how to build a supercomputer and how to be able to run it. And these are the students that I showed that uh, we are able to take them to the rest of the world and they have been doing very well in there. I think that's um, the part that talks about uh, all the meetings, but please, if you can also visit 
uh, and I will share on the chat here um, the link to the high performance computing in South Africa. You can be able to get all those meetings. The last one is uh, about the more collaboration. I think it is very important and I think the concept here that is being raised, the reason we have got praise, um, praise in Europe is partnership uh, for advanced computing in Europe. And, and why Europe went into that route is because they realized that not one single country in Europe will be able to have all the computing power and various architectures that a European scientist will need to be able to do their science. That was the basis of why PRAISE was formed. And if you look at um, um, uh, by the time when PRAISE was formed is that all the countries in Europe, they had supercomputers, but they were not as big as the supercomputers in the US. In the US, you can have various architectures in various labs and a scientist in the US can have access to all those various architectures. In Europe, you couldn't. And hence, praise was now giving a scientist in Europe to be able to have access to a computer in France while the scientist is sitting in Germany or have a com access to the computer in uh, the UK or uh, 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 in Germany or anywhere in, 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 in Europe. And hence, that was the, the most novel thing that came out of that to say, let us uh, unite and collaborate so that we can be able to give access uh, to our scientists. Now taking the very same concept, this is what helped us to build what we call the SADEC cyber infrastructure. Because in that we say, whatever the capacity that you have in the region in SADEC, that capacity should be able to allow a scientist anywhere in Southern to have access to their computing. So you shouldn't be sitting in, say for an example, in Lesotho and say that I don't have access to the computer. Or you're sitting in Mauritius and you say, I don't have access to your computer. I can't be able to solve this problem. That cuts out that uh, limitation uh, to make sure that whatever investments of the computing that can be brought together into one. So we are still on the first steps. And I think on what uh, Simon has presented on the um, African uh, Open Science Platform, that is also going now to expand on this so that we have got this collaboration across the continent. And that is still um, some uh, uh, program that is still um, uh, ongoing. Uh, we hope that once that is completed, we will have tangible infrastructure uh, to share across uh, the African continent. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, um, I, 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 I would like to thank all the speakers. Uh, this, ha this has been impressive. So I think, um, uh, you know, we should um, organize uh, another workshop or a mini workshop uh, where we can take uh, a morning or a whole day to uh, discuss all of these uh, wonderful developments and how they will support capacity building and and research and how they will get the continent as a whole uh, better connected that will be really of interest to us uh, at the african school of physics so I will be talking to uh, Chayamo so that uh, uh, at some time in the future we can we can have a workshop like that, and that will also give you guys the opportunity to really go into the details. Uh, it seems like uh, the time was a little bit rushed today, but nevertheless we got a lot out of it. Um, so um, I will suggest uh, that uh, we stop now. And then uh, uh, we we discuss with Chayamo on uh, uh, you know a more comprehensive workshop or a mini workshop uh, uh, later on. Um, so Chayamo, I really would like to thank you to bring uh, together uh, you know uh, Happy Simon and Mary Jane to try to give us all of this comprehensive uh, uh, 
um, informative education, educational information on all the really activities that are going on, which impact the development of science and research and education, and which is really the backbone of what we need in Africa. And it's, I'm very, very happy to see the wonderful things that you guys are doing. Um, no. no, thanks, Ketevi. Yeah. So, so, so let's stop for now. And then, Chamo, we I will contact you, and we can we can organize, uh, you know, a follow up of this workshop, and and have more time to discuss in in, in detail. Yes, in, indeed. I think um, uh, Happy and 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 Dr. Simon Hudson also mentioned the initiatives regarding research data uh, training. Uh, Codata, for example, is trying to finalize and home in on a curricula that they think scientists must, 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 must play around with around the issues of uh, research data management. I think a consortia or an organization like theirs, once a curricula like that is, is, is perfected, it will be very useful uh, for this thing to, to, be, to, be, to be disseminated and, 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 and run across institutions. Yeah. Uh, ICTP also runs some very, very good uh, uh, trainings. Uh, Dr. Stone is doing great. He, is, uh, he mentioned the, the the, the conference uh, that is happening in South Africa. Prior to that conference, there is also uh, training sessions. There is also winter schools um, in South Africa um, uh, regarding things like HPC and Python. I think this year it was also offered virtually. So I think these are resources that um, the cyber infrastructure long term uh, will also hope to, to, to replicate and make available to member states. So I think, I think that's something that uh, young scientists uh, ought, ought to know about in terms of what is happening, how they can connect to those. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, Christine, you want to add anything before we close? I'm trying to just uh, indeed for, for those list of the different training and activities for us, this is really important as well, this way as well to transfer the different information and the, the know-how. So it will be good potentially to have those lists and then we can put it as well on, uh, on our website. And in any case, again, so thanks so much for all this uh, very interesting presentation. So we should really have some follow up and some forum because I think there was a lot of other questions that uh, we may not have had time to, to emphasize. ICT is really as well the key for the future. So this is why it's very important what you're doing and to bring as well the capacity there in Africa with your own as well knowledge and, uh, and, and capacity. So this ecosystem is very, what will be sustainable as well in the long term. So that's uh, really important to emphasize what you're doing. So thanks a lot for all of that. Okay. Thank you colleagues. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye bye. Okay, on that note, uh, we'll stop for now. Thanks everybody. It's really appreciated. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.